in many senses Uday Kotak and the bank that carries his name Kotak Mahindra represent ambition and change that came with the liberalization of the Indian economy in 1991 in a country which is dominated by big public sector banks Uday was enamored by the famous and mint street banks in the US that proudly carried legacies but could a middle class boy born to a family of cotton traders really set up a world class bank in mumbai bearing his own name it's a confidence backed by hard work that led uday to set up the kotak mahindra bank in 2003 after cutting his teeth in the financial world today less than 20 years later kotak mahindra is india's third largest private sector bank What's more, it is one of the most respected names in the financial world. Let me start first with yourself. Uh, you're an entrepreneur, and uh, you left the family uh, cotton business. Otherwise, you would have been Uday Kapadia somewhere, uh, trading in cotton. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what it took to institutionalize. at such a large successful pan india bank uh, mr gopala krishnan the the history is that after i completed my mba i decided not to pursue a career uh, probably with an institution like uh, hindustan lever right and instead decided to join the family business and try to create something which was differentiated right and the reason why that is important is because uh, the family <sighs> business had a lot of cousins and other joint family members all working in the commodities and the cotton trading business and i was keen on doing something which was different and my passion was always financial services and therefore using the platform of the family business which had an office at flora fountain and which was ready to give me 200 square feet of office space was a good enough lure for me to start an entrepreneurial journey right and when i look back and i see the whole process i consider myself to be fortunate to have taken this call in 1982 83 when india was just on the cusp of change and we actually moved to forming a proper company in 1985 uh, which by 1986 we called it kotak mahindra finance and that was a time when india was getting the first winds of change you had seen the rajiv gandhi government come in uh, post the assassination of mrs gandhi and a fresh wind started blowing across india of course the the true Uh, a reform started a few years after that in the 90s but the winds of change were in the air and i consider myself as a product of the financial sector reform of india since the mid to late 80s into the early 90s to where we are and my journey in that in many ways reflects the changing landscape of indian financial sector so i consider myself to have been lucky to have been at the right place at the right time yeah well, that's uh, put with great humility uh, most successful people consider themselves lucky to be in the right place at the right time but a lot of it a lot of your own effort and work and vision went into this whole exercise when i think back of the 60s when i began my career i remember almost every other saturday i would have to go to some bank uh, and wait with a passbook and a checkbook for some woman to sit and enter the things manually and then i had to come home and check whether the calculations are right so you know it is just unimaginable when i tell my children that that's the way banking was um, can you tell us uh, now that you are the child of this whole revolution in banking and financial services what were the key differences that you saw then and now from yeah. an internal point of view i think the big change in india really happened in the early 90s uh and in many ways the 1991 budget was a watershed but shortly after the budget of 1991 if you recollect in 1992 we had the famous security scandal that what was popularly known as the harshad mehta scandal right right 
And that was the starting point of many changes which were happening in the Indian financial landscape. We had the formation of the Securities and Exchange Board of India, a significant reworking of the reform process, including at the Reserve Bank of India, post the security scandal, there was a JPC which went into it and many changes came out of that. And India started opening up gradually. So from uh, a time when you did the physical writing of the passbook, including checking the arithmetic uh, uh, with a multiplication um, expertise and everything else, we were also seeing the early advent of computerization. And in 1994, you also saw some new age banks being approved by the RBI uh, in the first flush of opening up of private sector banking. And that's about the time the biggest debate in Indian financial sector, particularly the public sector banks, was computerization. And just as computerization was being debated and talked about, the new age banking came in, financial sector liberalization started, and that was the beginning point of significant change in the Indian financial landscape. And I remember for us as a firm from being a bill discounting firm, we got into car finance, which was financing of cars. There we saw uh, the opening up of various segments. We saw the controller of capital issues concept removed. So the uh, uh, issuance by companies could be done at fair market price. Uh, we saw uh, the formation of the mutual fund industry. Um, and of course, in 2000, you saw the opening up of the life insurance sector. So the 90s were an exhilarating part of the financial sector change in India. And we therefore wrote that. And at the same time, we also made some major changes in our, uh, in our strategy and execution. We recognized that we were a little bit like frogs in a well. We needed to be able to find out how the larger and the bigger lake and ocean was. And I still recollect my first trip to the United States at, in 1992. And I'd gone there to meet Goldman Sachs. And that meeting was a uh, life-changing meeting for me in many ways, because post that in the 90s, we went into joint ventures with two global partners, Fort Credit and Goldman Sachs. And it is here that I must also make a mention of my friend and a person who lent his name to the company, Anand Mahindra, which happened in the 80s. And Ford went into a joint venture with Anand Mahindra, as a result of which we did a joint venture in the car financing business. And simultaneously with Goldman Sachs, the whole securities and the investment banking businesses. So many new businesses were taking shape and simultaneously wanted to get the best technology and knowledge from around the world. And that is the journey of Kotak through uh, the uh, 1990s. The concept of license Raj was going behind us. Competition was being ushered in. And in 2003, we saw us getting a banking license, which was a, a, a game-changing moment again. Two licenses were given. One was to us and another was to a bank called Yes Bank. And uh, both these licenses got into business uh, from 2003. In our case, we changed our existing company into a bank and it became from Kotak Mahindra Finance into Kotak Mahindra Bank. And I must say the journey uh, had its ups and downs, a lot of bumpiness, but overall the journey was a great pleasure as India opened up and we grew our wings in financial services. That's great because not only did you create a great uh, uh, enterprise for yourself, which is what you sort set out to do, but you also gave India a great financial institution in the form of Kotak Mahindra Bank. And, uh, and you not only gave India a great institution in financial services, it's probably one of India's most valuable institutions as well, if not the most valuable, depending on which day you looked at the earnings multiples and the market cap. So congratulations on that. From the, from the uh, exposition you just gave, it seems to me that there are three broad strands emerging. And uh, I'm going to periodically summarize these because we would like to draw these lessons together as part of our series of what uh, other entrepreneurs have learned for the benefit of those who are our viewers and listeners. The first you say, uh, and I'm using my words, not yours, uh, while regulation might have constrained activity, deregulation opened up opportunities. That is the first lesson I'm drawing from what you said. 
the second lesson that I'm drawing from what you're saying is that the financial services industry in particular opened up in a dramatic manner, not in a gradual manner. I mean, maybe in the 90s, much of what had to be done, the building blocks of those institutions were set, SEBI, Reserve Bank, and so on and so forth. And the third is good entrepreneurs like yourself, who had an honest view of business, moved very quickly and got their licenses and maybe had a few breaks, but also put in a lot of hard work. Have I summarized what you said in my words correctly? Broadly, I agree with you, Mr. Gopalakrishna. Hmm. Right. Now, it is important that viewers of this uh, uh, program must also get the lessons. If I have to ask you to crystallize from the last part, the entrepreneurial uh, grabbing of the opportunity in an honest and sustainable way, I keep emphasizing honest and sustainable because those are very important parts of institution building. What are the three lessons you would comment to them? I think a lot of lessons uh, in a journey, but if I have to uh, bring it down to three lessons, the first and the most important lesson which I learned was then that when something is too good to be true, it is. And let me take you back to the 90s, post-1997, um, as we were uh, riding this growth wave, we saw many, many players come into the NBFC space. And we saw almost every business house in the country rush into becoming a financial services player. And because the financial services industry looked like it was very, very good and very easy money. And with the kind of rush we saw, um, I began to get actually a little concerned as a risk manager. And we actually started getting more cautious and conservative from a risk point of view from 1997-1998. And we saw the Asian crisis hit post-Thailand in 1997. India increased interest rates. And suddenly, the financial sector in India went through a significant trough. And most of the new NBFCs and others who came into business in the 90s were basically in deep trouble by 2000, and many of them wound up by 2002, 2003. If you recollect the challenges with which the then Unit Trust of India faced in the late 90s, and the traditional financial institutions also had to reinvent themselves, whether it was IDBI, IFCI, and even ICICI Limited. So the financial sector pain of the late 90s transformed the sector. But it gave me one very important lesson that don't rush in just because things look good. You need to have a very solid, sustainable approach and things are never as good as they look. Therefore, that's the first lesson. When things look too good to be true, they probably are. The second important lesson is uh, if what you create cannot outlast you. Therefore, it's, uh, uh, if it does not, that's not a good sign. They will create institutions which are sustainable. How do you build an institution in posterity? It's all very good for a, uh, an entrepreneur or a manager to succeed in the short run. What does it take to succeed in the medium and long term, especially when there's a lot of change around you? Therefore, I give a lot of uh, importance to sustainability versus quick short-term profits. So that's the second point that create institution which outlasts the individual. And here I give the example of my own learnings. When I went to the US for the first time, what struck me was the scale and size of US institutions, whether it's a JP Morgan, a Goldman Sachs, or a Merrill Lynch, or any of these institutions. And the most interesting aspect of these institutions is that once upon a time, they were started by individuals or families, but they've outlasted them and have effectively become institutions. Therefore, what is it that we at Kotak Mahindra can do to create an institution which is sustainable? And the third and the extremely uh, critical point as well is that as you grow, be very careful about uh, building a culture of middle-class values. We were a set of people who were built on middle-class values. We did not have hubris. And at every stage, we tried to avoid hubris. And we have a line within us also which says there is a very thin line between conviction and foolhardiness. And at times, 
when you think it is conviction please don't border it on a, on a, a foolhardiness which is what is the downfall and therefore a culture and a humility with true middle class values are the basis of building an institution you know it's very interesting uh, big, that if i look at the startup uh, albeit in a different field there are many startups today and you got a lot of startups becoming unicorns uh, in a great hurry the reported culture as you read from the pink papers and so on is not quite what you stated first you said if it's too good to be true it probably is so a certain amount of conservatism the second thing that i heard you say is uh, be focused on what can go wrong and manage risks the third thing i heard you say albeit in answer to the earlier question was the branding was very important for you kotak mahindra bank made a lot of difference compared to kotak bank i think i heard you uh, mention the association mahindra for which you are very grateful and the fourth thing i heard that you are very adaptive that when the downturn happened uh, it is not something that uh, you could allow the thing to sink so you had your eyes on the long term and sustainability uh, if these are the four characteristics that you put in from day one when you look at the startup environment today i don't know if they are following any of these four what is your sort of opinion general opinion on this what i have, what i think has changed in today's times compared to say when 10 or 15 or 20 years ago is the speed of change right and therefore one of the lessons for today's times is if you have to take some decisions right or wrong take them faster you right. do not have the luxury of time which we had in the 80s and 90s so to that extent i think there is a structural change speed to market speed of change is crucial and many of the today's startups are actually doing great work in that area what doesn't change is with reference to the fundamentals of a sustainable business model fundamentals of proper processes fundamentals of governance uh, in the early stages many uh, entrepreneurs get success how do you convert that success into a process oriented sustainable business model without giving up the innovative and entrepreneurial spirit that i think is something which is crucial and in today's world with the flush of liquidity and risk capital available i think it's a time when there will be startups who will be big successes and there will be many who may not succeed i think we have to live with that reality of much greater mortality for a few successes in our times mortality was really a big issue it was looked down upon it was considered to be a negative on the career of a professional or an entrepreneur today's times have changed they respect mortality making business uh, mistakes uh, entrepreneurs failing and being allowed to come back and have another shot at either a professional role or another entrepreneurial role therefore the context has changed but the fundamentals of ensuring creativity and enterprise with process and sustainability will remain irrespective of the times thank you uh, two things uh, left out uh from what you said uh one is the process orientation the second is governance and the third one which you have implied rather than said explicitly on this occasion is about acquiring talent good people in fact one of your own talented executives uh, left and moved on to start up and is a very successful startup today uh, about to come for an ipo so i want you to spend a little bit of time on these three aspects uh governance process or now process orientation is spoken about can you talk a little bit about governance and talent as yeah. key building blocks in an institution but yeah. yeah i mean i'll start with the second and then come to the governance point i think the critical success factors <laughs> as i see for, uh, for entrepreneurship today are three parts customer talent and technology and out of that uh the, the talent piece gets extremely important because the talent of today must have a customer in perspective and it must be combined with a solid knowledge or or a background at least in the core some of the core leadership on understanding technology but this aspect about talent 
cannot take us away from the importance of culture. Uh, the success of foreign institution is not just IQ, but also EQ. And we need, therefore, in the talent, a fair mix of EQ as we grow, go forward. Brings me to the second point, and I think that's a very crucial point, which is governance. And here I would like to make a distinction between today's times, ticking the box, governance, rule orientation, which policymakers seem to be focused on, to the substance of governance. For me, the substance of governance is ensuring that all my stakeholders, even if it is one share out of 100, get the same deal as the rest of the 99. And how am I making sure that every act of a institution is consistent with its responsibilities to all the shareholders in general? And I'm here pausing because we are now getting to a larger debate in terms of what does governance mean? It has moved broader from just shareholder to a concept of stakeholder and larger contribution for society. And it is here that I think a lot of the challenges and the frictions will come in the future. Where do you draw the line between what is right for stakeholder interest and shareholder interest? And my general view is that what is good for society is ultimately good for shareholders, yes, as well. And there is a time gap and the friction time gap with the shareholder uh, time horizon versus the purpose of a company. And some of these principles are what governance is all about. And there are three layers, as you know, it is the shareholders, the uh, board and the management. I do believe that we need to make sure that there is an alignment and a certain amount of uh, synchronism between these parts. I do worry that in current world, there is too much of real or created friction through figments of rules, which actually create distrust rather than bringing in complete alignment. And I would therefore genuinely believe that for sustainable governance, it cannot be rules alone. It has to be rules to a certain extent only. And what is true governance is principles. And principles will be decided by the marketplace in terms of how they value companies rather than ticking the box. It's interesting, you talked of these three layers. Uh, shareholder, stakeholder, and uh, um, stakeholder board, and uh, the management. Uh, whose job is it to keep this balance? Is it the promoter, or is it the chairman who may or may not be the promoter? Or whose job is it to make this happen? I think it, that is where this has to be a symphony, okay. and it cannot be demarketed into box one, two, and three. The symphony needs to work. And the toughest part of the symphony is uh, actually the, the horizon of the shareholders. If the shareholder horizons in terms of the mix is short term, then the symphony gets tougher. If the horizon of the shareholder is more medium term in terms of the mix, it changes. And that is where the, then the next question comes between very diversified ownership versus some dominant shareholder ownership in terms of where is the balance. My personal view is that a shareholder ownership, which is in the range of somewhere between 20 to 30, 35% is a good balance. And which makes sure that there is skin in the game. Combined with make the broad based ownership of a public company, a very widely distributed shareholder shareholding and uh, short-term horizons of many shareholders may lead to outcomes, which is what we in India may call as quarter say quarter tuck, rather than medium-term approach to building a business. Right, I think that makes a lot of sense. 20 to 35 is well chosen because 26 is a, a very important uh, landmark in the, the rights of uh, uh, the, the major shareholder. Um, do you think, Dialogue and conversation helps in achieving this? I think dialogue and conversation is certainly extremely useful. But most importantly, I think dialogue and conversation should be towards building trust. 
but you know trust very often is not about talk it is about walk and sustained walk is what builds trust and how do companies demonstrate that over medium to long periods of time that they are walking the talk and not just talking the talk i'm glad you said this very often not very often sometimes as i've given speeches to young people they would say listen you worked in very well established highly reputed companies like lever and tata and i can i'm extending that to you saying now you are the head of a very well respected and successful financial institution this all all right for you to say about trust and so on what do i do in the early stages my company is only 5 or 7 years old uh, and they ask me for their advice and uh, i wonder what you would say to them if this, this question must have been asked of you by other people uh, surely no i think my advice to people building a company is governance is not just about structures and rules governance is about being honest to yourself and having a mirror facing you that every day asking yourself is this the right thing for me to do and as long as the mirror is giving you the answer it does not matter what other people may or may not say so uh, i i have coined a term for this uh, which i claim no originality for that every ceo or senior leader in any enterprise requires a point of constructive dissonance you know like an optical mirror shows the warts and moles on your face yeah you need a psychological mirror which tells you that you may go astray because if you look at the history of all those uh, so called scams or frauds and so on that is written about in the us or in india it is not all of them were sitting and scheming every morning how to diddle yeah. the revenue department or how to short chain somebody else it happened on a particular decision and then to cover up that decision other things happened and so on and so forth so uh, i think the important thing to remember is this can happen to anybody uh, a, a scam a fraud a misjudgment and the only way to avoid it is constantly having constructive dissonance which may come sometimes even from your wife who's not concerned with your business yeah. or a very dear friend or a colleague in the office or another professional it doesn't matter from where uh, have you had this experience of course of course because uh, you know this is something which um you, i have i have been fortunate especially in my early career to have a unique gentleman called mr sydney pinto who started merchant banking in india in grinlays bank he was in my early days my mentor and he actually guided me on what to do what not to do where to draw the line where he was a, a lawyer and a company secretary by knowledge uh, by by uh, qualification and the do's and don'ts and how to handle it is something which came deep to me and of course you know there's another very interesting history for me having born in a joint family with 60 family members a lot of the social learning about what is the right behavior came to me through my joint family system as well which helped me in good stead i just wanted to make another uh, point in the context of governance what we have to be clear about is governance is not about reducing creativity and entrepreneurship yes it means that we must follow principles which are fair to all but it should not take us away from the purpose and mission of a fast changing business and the world we are in and creativity and entrepreneurship should continue to thrive even as we get the process and the control side of the business very often governance is con uh, construed as excessive process and control it is not about process and control it's about fundamentally and substantively doing what is right but doing what is right is fully consistent with being creative and entrepreneurial to change the landscape of the institution you are running that's great so you're saying the rules don't change in between you have yeah. to be consistent it's just like you raise your kids i mean the rules are about the same be honest be good study hard yeah. work hard etc you don't start doing that when the kid is 8 years old or 10 years old is probably a bit too late to do that question having heard your very uh, articulate and persuasive uh, description in a summary form of uh, 40 years or 45 years of your journey uh, if you had to relive all this again 
which you may not want to, but I'm just asking a hypothetical question. Are there two or three things you would do differently, which you learned out of your experience? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, there, are, there are obviously each of us, when we look back, we feel that there are points of time in history when we could have done things differently. One, I mean, when I go back to the, uh, the, on the business side, I go back to 2008. And I have, I genuinely believe I made the mistake of reading the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times too much. <laughs> and I became very cautious. It made me feel like the world is coming to an end. In fact, if I had not read those papers, I would have been bolder in my, continuing with my expansion between 2008 and 2010 11. I slowed down because the Financial Times told me the world is in deep trouble. And therefore, I am a believer that finally you may read, imbibe information, but don't let your instinct get curbed just by what other people are saying. So that is one of the lasting learnings I've had. The second important learning out of numerous Agni Parikshas is the criticality of risk management. How well you believe that if things did go wrong, your ability to measure how wrong they can be in taking your call for the upside. Therefore, in sim simple English for entrepreneurs of today, be clear of being able to measure your downside, but keep your upside open. So what you're saying is, if you're attracted to a particular course of action, uh, because you may get an upside of 100, Calculate the downside is also 100, in which case you may come to a different conclusion than yeah. 100 upside and 50 or 30 or something downside. That's yeah. the point you're making. Yeah, you I'm saying be, in a, be cautious in terms of being able to measure your downside. Don't uh, measure your upside too early. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Uday, thank you very much for that very fine exposition. You condensed into half an hour what you've been through for the last 40 years. Uh, you clearly believe in what you're saying. And if uh, a doubting Thomas wants uh, evidence for that, it's the fact that you put your name on the bank. It's very unusual uh, that these days, in the old days it was different, but these days uh, banks come with a neutral name, you know, and there are examples of it, yes, ICICI IC, and so on. Uh, what made you do that and what is the value you attach to that? You know, um, one of the most important things is his or her name. Yep. And if you're ready to stake your name and reputation on the line for customers and investors and stakeholders, that's a very important point. You go back to the history of merchant banks in the world. An S.G. Warburg, a Schroders, a Rothschilds, and of course, we discussed the U.S. cases of J.P. Morgan, Goldman. All these are firms which had names of individuals put on them. It has been a history to say, for building trust, we are ready to put our name on the line. And that was the philosophy why we decided to put our name on the line, because we cared about trust, brand, and reputation. And this was the core of what made us do what we ha have done. And frankly, um, Uday Kotak, the individual, has a limited horizon. But the institution with the brand Kotak, hopefully, has to have the ability of outlasting the individual. Uh, so, Uday, uh, these are very, uh, uh, very deeply philosophical. Uh, attributes that you're bringing out. I uh, want to close out on the discussion on your specific bank by asking you a question which often comes up uh, in promoter-driven, uh, promoter-influenced uh, organizations. What do you think of succession planning and the role of family members? Because you said you're coming from a family of 60. So theoretically, there are 59 people in the queue, but obviously that's not the case. So tell us a bit about your thinking on professionalization and succession planning. I mean, it's pretty clear that my successor will not be my family member. So that is pretty clear. And I am a believer that when I think about my role currently at Kotak Mahindra Bank, it has three parts. That of a manager, a board member, and a significant shareholder. 
with the changing times the speed at which we are seeing change particularly in the post covid world i think we are in a whole new planet of challenge and opportunity in that context the tough question which an individual must ask himself or herself that irrespective of your level of ownership or anything else the future of this institution from the point of view of management may need different skills and being facing that as the new reality which we must i am clear the institution must be managed by people appropriate for the institution at this point of time and therefore i have to look at my role beyond that of being a manager in due course and something which i am comfortable with and i genuinely feel as a significant shareholder that is the transition and transformation which is the strength of building this institution hopefully into perpetuity great so what you are really saying somebody uh, in another interview somebody said i am my philosophy is enterprise first in family second yeah and you 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 are confirming your view that you totally agree with that enterprise first family second a family and, member and, may and a third point gopal a third point yeah the role of a manager and that of an owner are very different roles right and the person you want as a ceo is not an owner but you are placing him there as a manager to run absolutely. the absolutely right uh, i want to before we close uh, ask you to speculate a little into the future how do you think the indian economy will go in the 20s 30s 2040s uh, financial institutions banks Well, just talk talk a bit to that general question. You know, I think uh, one of the reasons why human beings can sustain themselves is because the normal purpose of a human being is to have an optimistic lens about the future, and keeping that perspective in mind, I believe that uh, a lot of things are changing in the world. There is a massive global rebalancing with the power of china vis-a-vis -vis the power of us so china is one big enigma for which many of us still don't have all the answers and in fact some of the challenges currently faced with china are going to be opportunities for a country like india i frankly believe that after a very tough covid period india has actually been able to come back and come back with a bang and of course the immediate economic recovery has been pretty good and if india can build a sustainable growth rate of around 7.5 to 8% and a per capita income growth rate of 6.5 to 7% over a long period of time the indian economy has got a lot of legs one of the things which we in our country must focus on is to ensure that not only do we get very high growth we are able to ensure that the benefits of growth spread well across the broader society and citizens and if we can achieve that balance between high growth and a fair distribution i am very optimistic about india's future and technology is giving us a big leap frog digital world is giving us a big leap frog and frankly the third area of change is going to be sustainability on the climate side how well india copes with that change is also going to be crucial for india's destiny i think about planet earth as a whole new planet today and we need to reinvent ourselves in this new planet in the post covid and post climate change world we are living in lovely uday thank you you've given us a lot of time and i'm sure in the context of uh, uh, india at 75 which is what has pro uh, prompted uh, nhi to undertake this series a number of nuggets have emerged which they will summarize and i think it will be absolutely invaluable for future enterprise builders i have de deliberately not just saying entrepreneurs because entrepreneurs must be enterprise builders from day one uh, as you have explained so thank you so much for your time for your insight and for your sharing so freely and candidly i appreciate it Bye. thank you very much and i wish lhi all the best in its journey thank you very much thank you